get started, just want to read. <laughs> just want to read some affirmations to you all that you are loved, you are not alone, you are seen, and you are heard. And this is really the message we hope to leave you with today um, in this town hall setting. Thanks so much for joining us and being part of this community event. Um, as we get started, I'm going to pass it um, to Aaron to help introduce kind of like our intention, why we're here today. Thank you, Matthew, so much. Um, welcome, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us this evening for the National Alliance on Mental Illness Westside LA's Town Hall event. In partnership with the City of West Hollywood, LA County Department of Mental Health, NAMI California, and the Mental Health Oversight and Accountability Commission. And like Matthew said, um, really setting an intention for this evening, we are here today to reflect back the lessons we've learned from our community through our previous listening session, share relevant and responsive local mental health resources, and to facilitate conversations about how our community's mental health needs can be addressed through local and statewide initiatives. Our moderator this evening is a catalyst who forms bridges between leaders across fields by spurring collaboration, creative problem solving, and collective efforts to support our communities. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and this year's NAMI Westside LA's Rising Star recipient, Matthew Dipp. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Erin. I'm gonna need you to copy and paste that welcome for me. <laughs> Um, but we're so glad to have you all here today, and our agenda is jam-packed with so many awesome speakers and just a lot of goodies for us all today. So um, we're going to actually open up with a wellness activity just to kind of ground us. You know, we're talking about mental health and resources, and so we want to kind of fill our cups and take this moment to breathe. Uh, we're so lucky to have Alicia join us today in leading this exercise. Alicia will be able to introduce themselves in just a bit. Then we'll have our keynote and opening presentations. So excited to have here today, Dr. Curly Bonds with the Department of Mental Health, Council Member John Erickson, Sharon Dunas with NAMI West LA, um, Nick Mariano with Alcott Center and Ashley McGollum with the Alcott Center. Um, after our presentation today, these presenters will actually be our panelists for the town hall Q&A. So on top of sharing a bunch of amazing resources and initiatives happening um, throughout LA, they'll be having a direct like back and forth conversation with all of you. to some of the things that you're interested in learning about, maybe a little bit more about the initiatives they've shared or just other things happening throughout the county. Um, and so, yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and um, pass it on over to Alicia to lead us through our wellness activity for today. Hello, everyone. Um, just to share who I am, I am a wellness practitioner and facilitator um, who, and I co-create spaces, hold on, I see my, uh, self view and for my nervous system, I'm going to hide that. So give me one second. Uh, amazing. I think this will do. Um, so as I was saying, I co-create spaces for the exploration of well-being on both individual and collective levels. Um, so in specific, specifically, I work in yoga and meditation. I believe that yoga is not done. It is to be with oneself and community. So with that said, my pronouns are uh, they, them, theirs, or she, her, hers. I use them interchangeably. And I'm on the wondrous land of the Chumash Tongva people, indigenous tribes. The colonized name for this land is Los Angeles, which many of you are familiar with. Um, in addition to the titles I hold and carry, I am a community member just like you. And so I'm really grateful to be in community here with you all and offer an invitation to move. And so for the next 10 minutes, this exploration is an opportunity to tune in and resource into your nervous system so that we can show up in community and have conversation about mental health and well being. So, just a few housekeeping. Um, points I like to always share. You can have your cameras on or off, do what's best for you. You can have any props nearby, if that's a blanket, a pillow, 
an animal, a child, whatever it may be that can support you in this practice, it is welcome here. And these, this exploration is for you, an opportunity for you to show up for yourself and to explore interconnectedness, being in community and presence with yourself and community. So um, what I'll also name is that some of my offerings will land differently for right. folks. Right. So I'll invite right. us all to get curious about um, the words that I use and give yourself permission to explore what works best and is most comfortable for you. Um, inviting a sense of compassion or comfort and care and not non-judgment, whoa, non-judgment with your movement. Um, and in this space, we are co-creating and normalizing all expressions of being. So if you'd like to sit for this practice, you're welcome to do so. And I'll invite us to explore some dynamic movement. So I just noticed in my nervous system, I'm kind of moving from side to side. You may sway side to side, just shifting the weight from one sit bone to the other. Just taking a few moments and inviting any organic movement. So maybe that is reaching the arms overhead, reaching one arm to the left or to the right, doing the same on the other side. Your eyes can be open or closed, whatever feels comforting in this moment. And again, inviting a sense of non-judgment. Inviting some neck rolls. So maybe you bring your right ear to your right shoulder, pausing, bringing your chin to your chest. Then left ear to left shoulder. And knowing you have the agency to move as you please, because this is your practice. So I offered a few options. Maybe you try one on and see what works best in this moment. You might get curious about, hmm, what would it feel like to bring my chin to my chest and pause? Any sensations? Again, if some of you are moving, that is totally okay. Moving just like that for a few cycles of breath. So maybe you invite a cat or a cow. So if we're moving into cat and cow, we open and puff the chest towards the screen. Maybe gaze looks up and forward. Exhale, we round the spine. One more breath cycle, just as you are, you all are moving so beautifully. And in the next breath, you might get curious about finding the middle, your sense of where weight is equally distributed in your sit bones. You might notice there's a sense of stillness, even if you're moving, if you are moving. And I invite you to look around and orient yourself to the external space that you're in. You may orient, or orient yourself to the screen, but I'll ask you to orient yourself to the space that you're in, allowing your eyes to guide the movement and pausing when you see an object that you're like, ooh, this looks cool. Pausing there. I have a tendency to um, look at objects that I need to clean and organize. And if that is something you're noticing, maybe you look at an object and you name the quality of that object. So for me right now, I'm looking at a pothos plant and it's green. And again, moving as fast or as slow as is comfortable for you, allowing movement to happen. One more breath cycle, just as you are moving. And then I'll invite you to bring your awareness to the areas of your body that are in contact with the ground. So where the physical outline of your body finds support. So maybe that is your sit bones, your ankles, the tops of your feet, maybe the soles of the feet. Just bringing your awareness there. 
And you might notice the support of the earth underneath you and consider easing into that support any amount more. Maybe you soften the jaw, the shoulders. You might notice any sensations that are present. And then, and if none, inviting a sense of self-compassion to what is, to holding a sense of comfort and care. The next few moments, I'll invite you to check in with your breath, your life force, something that happens without you telling it to happen. And you'll have options to bring your hands to your heart and to your belly. This is an option. If you'd like to explore a different sense of touch, sometimes for my nervous system, I like and I need a pillow. So I'll invite that here as well. Just taking a few moments to make contact with the body in any comfortable way. And just noticing the breath moving in and out of the nose. few cycles of breath just as you are breathing. And on your next inhale, I'll invite you to breathe in through the nose, into the chest and into the belly. And exhale, you're letting that go. Doing that one more time in through the nose, inviting a deeper breath, tuning in to the parasympathetic nervous system, our rest, digest, and relaxation response. And let's do that a few more times, breathing in through the nose, into the chest, maybe into the belly, and just letting it go. One more, just like that, knowing if you are moving, finding some movement as you're exploring your breath, that is welcome here. If your eyes can stay uh, open or closed, you might have a soft gaze with a focal point. I'd like to offer a metta or a loving kindness meditation, which is rooted in um, a Buddhist practice that can be approached in several ways. Um, and loving kindness is the um, cultivation of unconditional compassion, love, trust, joy, gratitude towards all beings and oneself. Um, and I'll invite you to offer this meditation out loud. Um, so you can repeat each line after me out loud or you can repeat it silently. Um, the invitation is to direct that, direct the words towards yourself. And we'll begin. May I be loved and loving. May I trust my inherent belonging. May I be safe and protected. May I be as healthy as I can be in this moment. May I have a lasting peace. So just taking a few moments with your breath, tuning into your sense of grounding, coming back, to that awareness of what areas of your body are in contact with ground or with chair, with support. If your eyes are closed or soften, I invite you to open them. And if they're already open, they're already there. Taking a few moments to orient yourself to your space. So maybe you look around once more. Maybe you notice something new. 
orienting yourself to the screen, the community that you're in. And to close, I will invite you to find a sense of loving containment with what is a heart hug. Um, so your right hand is underneath your left armpit. Your right hand, left hand can find your right arm, whether it's the shoulder, the middle of the arm, the elbow. Again, if this sense of containment is too contained, a pillow might be helpful here as well. And you also can take another gesture. Offering a heart hug. Then bow our chins to our chests, offering a sense of gratitude to yourself, for all that you are, and to each other for being in this collaborative space together. We'll seal the practice with an inhale through the nose. Maybe an exhale out of the mouth. One more time, just like that. In through the nose. Exhale out of the mouth. Thank you um, for co-creating this space with me. The love and divine light within me honors, sees, admires, and is inspired by the love and light and divinity within each of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was beautiful and so needed. I think so often in this space of advocacy, you know, we're constantly moving and trying to do the work. And how often do we get the chance to slow down and tune back in with ourselves? And how much more powerful, you know, can we be as a community when we take that time to fill our cups? Um, so thank you so much, Alicia. That was much appreciated. And we'll get to um, share some more space with Alicia as a break later on. And yeah, as we move on to today, hopefully this is a model that you can take with you in other advocacy spaces. Um, and just for yourself, to, to remember to tune back into yourself and, and hold this space for yourself. So thanks so much. And I will go ahead and pull up our agenda again. Um, and so we're going to pass it over to our keynotes and opening presentations. And after that, we'll be sharing a little bit from our listening sessions. Um, or you know what? Flip that. I'm going to share a little bit from our listening sessions um, that we had, the listening session that we had a couple weeks ago, um, because the keynote and the presentations are very responsive to the needs and um, interests that you all expressed and um, some of those who attended last time who aren't here. And so these are some of the themes that I pulled up. Um, and so our community recently shared, you know, there's this big need for more accessible services. And in terms of accessibility, you're mentioning things like lower cost or free services, culturally competent services, doing more outreach with community members so they know what's out there, and just having more diverse options in general. There's also been expressed a need for a more well-rounded system of care in LA. So having access to prevention, um, to intervention, to crisis support, to even aftercare. So what happens you know, after um, we get supported in a crisis? How do we continue to get connected to care? Also investing in community care, the ways that our community members are able to take care of each other, having clinical services, and then spaces to build our individual skills to navigate wellness, as well as our relationships with others. There's also a need or a desire to invest in growing our behavioral health workforce, investing in the diversity of that workforce, um, having more of a peer workforce, educating community members to be able to support each other, and moving away from a reliance on law enforcement and crisis responses, and having the workforce that can actually step in to do that. You also talk so much about considering equity in our behavioral health supports and services. And it was so great to see so many resources highlighted to support um, people who are former or, former or current foster youth, um, the trans and queer community, our immigrant and undocumented neighbors, our unhoused neighbors, so many different community members were uplifted. And we asked kind of on average how supported we feel in our community with the resources we have 
and tallying it up, the average score was 4.72 out of 10. So today, as we listen to our keynote and our presenters, we hope that this helps shed a light on some of the great resources and initiatives that are happening in our community because they are out there. And also um, for them to have this conversation with us to help illuminate you know, the direction that these resources, our support system is moving towards that we can have a more responsive system of care. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to our keynote, Dr. Curly Bonds here representing the LA Department of Mental Health. Thank you, Matthew. And also thank you, Alicia. I was really taken away by your meditation and it included movement and loving kindness and all of the things that we know we should do, but sometimes don't take enough time to do. Um, I almost felt like we can all just go home after that. But um, I'm here as a representative of the, your Department of Mental Health for Los Angeles County. I am the current Chief Medical Officer. I've been serving in that capacity for a little over four years now. But just to tell you a little bit about myself before I launch into slides and resources, I trained at UCLA in the Westwood campus and was on the general faculty for psychiatry for about 10 years before I then moved to the county to work at a place called Charles Drew, which is in South Los Angeles, which serves a historically underserved, mostly black and brown population. I went there as department chair. And then when the hospital closed, I went to the jail and worked at Twin Towers for about three years and also helped start up a women's community reentry program for women exiting the, the jail system. And then went to DD Hirsch as the program as a medical director for about eight years. And then a former student of mine became the director of the Department of Mental Health, a neuropsychiatrist named Jonathan Sharon, who has been our boss of uh, mine for the whole time I've been there, but he's been in place for about five years also UCLA trained and he is retiring, even though he's about my age, which scares me. Um, so I will apologize in advance because after this talk, I will have to leave because I'm subbing for Dr. Sharon as a voluntold person to go to another event. But I did wanna be here to share with you all because the last piece of my intro is that NAMI is not only important to me as a provider, I've been a card carrying NAMI member for many years now, not just supporting the walks, but also giving the talks and um, I have a family member who is seriously and persistently mentally ill, who throughout my life has been kind of the backdrop through which I viewed mental health and led me to come into this, this space as a provider. And that's always going to be my um, effort is to think that everyone should have access to the type of care that kept her alive. So I'm going to share my screen or attempt to, um, if I can, let's see. Hopefully you'll see my desktop now and then a PowerPoint should come up. If you aren't seeing that, let me know. Is everybody able to see a kind of blue background? Okay, great. So this is the town hall. And again, excited to be here. Thank you to NAMI for inviting me. So the first thing I'll do is a DMH overview. And this is just to tell you that our department is huge. We are the 8,000 pound gorilla that sits in the, the space of mental health. We're the largest directly operated county mental health program in the country. We have about 85 directly operated sites, but we also have contracts with about a thousand different legal entities, many of whom are in the community doing the same work that we do. They should be pretty much symmetrical with what the directly operated programs do. And it's not always easy to tell the difference between the two. We serve over 250,000 residents per year and eight different service areas. LA, in terms of how it's divided up, the NAMI West LA is in what's called service area five. And if I go to the next slide, we'll be able to see that. Um, this is it in this uh, sort of light green, lime green over to the left. And then this is it in a more pronounced way. It has parts of coastal LA, of course. I'm a Venice resident and also have worked in Westwood. I have a tiny private practice that's actually down the hall from where the NAMI West LA headquarters is, if I'm not mistaken, that's in the shadow of UCLA. But our headquarters is actually in Koreatown. So I'm gonna focus on some of the resources in West LA for this talk, but overall we offer services that are designed to be recovery and well-being oriented. 
I think sometimes people talk about us not having a mental health system, we have a mental illness system, because it's almost as if you have to fail before you can get resources. That 4.72 I thought looked pretty good until I realized that it wasn't a Yelp 5, but a 10, which is, I think, something that we all need to work collectively to improve on. And I think there is much that we can do. But our recovery and well-being programs are aimed to help keep our clients and families in community. We really want to help them achieve their goals, find a safe place to live, have a meaningful life, and have healthy relationships. And we need to help people sometimes by getting them access to public entitlements. If they don't have food, clothing, and shelter, it's hard for them to benefit from mental health care. Whether uh, Christ sees successfully and also have the best possible physical health. So I think one thing that I've heard my thoughts is that people should have persons, place, and purpose in their life. So that's what we attempt to do. Okay, oops. This is just a, a diagram that shows all the different services. There are different spokes that center um, on mental health services. They range from residential programs, outreach to the homeless, clinical programs, prevention, early intervention that we'll talk about in a moment. We operate some urgent care centers through directly um, contracted agencies and also wellness centers. We serve all age groups. Sometimes people say cradle to grave, that's a little bit morbid, but we definitely focus on sort of that middle transitional age youth and adults are the bulk of our services, but we also have some programs for as early as zero to five. Prevention and early intervention, sometimes known as PEI, are services that are designed to target those folks who are either in the early stages of a mental health crisis or illness, or else folks who um, we can prevent having mental health problems. And we know now the ravages of trauma, say with COVID, there are things that we can do to support people and help with the social determinants of health. So this is actually funding that comes to us from the state through a program called the MHSA, the Mental Health Services Act, affectionately known as the millionaire tax, where everyone who's fortunate enough to earn more than a million dollars pays money into this pot. And part of the programs are to help with things like kicking off programs at key, what we call access platforms, such as schools, libraries, um, parks. We have a program called Parks After Dark, where we partner with Parks and Recreation to have resources available, mostly focusing on kids. Uh, there are short-term early interventions, especially for those who are newly diagnosed. We have suicide prevention. Well, here it says hotlines, but they're actually crisis lines. And then we do a fair amount of training and intervention, sometimes through our partners like Dee Dee Hirsch, and then stigma and discrimination reduction is ongoing. May is Mental Health Month, and so I'd encourage you to check out a program called We Rise. It's actually the county's um, effort to help reduce stigma and educate folks. If you do hashtag why we rise or we rise LA, you'll find a number of events that are both in-person and virtual throughout the month of May. I mentioned that we have a DMH access line that sometimes is called the hotline, but it's really the number that you probably need to write down if you haven't already got it in your phone. If you're a family member of someone or a friend or a support or an ally, when they have a crisis, this is a number that's the all access number for our services ranging from mental health screening to finding a provider, sometimes they're able to make appointments, and also crisis counseling. They also mobilize the field response. So we know that uh, earlier, I think we talked about not wanting to call the police because that's not the best intention. They'll come out with weapons and maybe escalate a situation. There are some circumstances where it's needed, but when possible, we prefer to have mental health clinicians, our psychiatric mobile response team roll out, and that's all access through this number as well as linkages to other services and resources. In addition to the main warm, our hotline now, we have an emotional support warm line that has trained active listeners. We partnered with UCLA to do this. It's available for most of the workday. And there's also a line specifically for veterans. So what might you expect from our clinics? Uh, we'll talk about the ones in, in this area. But first of all, individual psychotherapy is still the mainstay of what we do. Um, not all of our clients receive medications. Um, they also receive other evidence-based supports, peer support, which is critically important. Some of the most compelling stories of recovery have involved people that have lived experience, and I think that's key, and I think NAMI definitely supports that. Medications are a part of it. We have about 
225 psychiatrists in the department. Uh, they think they're the center of the universe, but as their leader, I tell them that nothing can happen without a team. And so they work closely with other team members that might do things like case management, run groups, do crisis intervention. And also we try to link people to primary care because if you're not um, physically well, it's hard to benefit from mental health care as well. Benefits establishment, again, it's important to have those key things um, on Maslow's Pyramid met. Housing, we do have some programs like FSP or full service partnership where people are eligible for housing subsidies or even free housing. Vocational and pre-vocational opportunities, we do help with employment as well as field-based services, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment. So uh, what are some of the examples of groups that you might see happening at our clinics? If you were to walk in, we honestly are under-resourced, so we depend a lot on group efforts. So healthy living, this is just a laundry list of what we thought are the core groups that all of our programs should offer. Substance use disorder treatment, we now have some folks who are offered medication-assisted treatment for like opiate dependence and other substance use problems. Mood disorders, peer-led groups, art, music, exercise, you'd likely see now yoga and meditation going on. Uh, despite the epidemic, some of these things are still happening. A lot of our work is done virtually, but there are also options to have services rendered in person as well. Some of the evidence-based treatments that we offer, of course, trauma-informed care is a touch phrase right now that you hear a lot about. We have many clinicians who are trained in delivering that type of care. So it takes into account what the individual's experienced. Of course, treatments for depression, and I would say anxiety as well is on this list. First break psychosis, those who have um, parenting and family difficulties to get support around that. So situational crises, we have a lot of crisis intervention that happens, and especially with kids, disruptive behavior assistance. One area that I will mention that isn't here, but um, I am a proud member of the LGBT community, and I brought on board a new special services assistant and specialist for LGBTQ plus services. Her name is Rebecca Gitlin, a very talented psychologist who does outreach and helps uh, train our staff about how to approach members of that community, including things like letter writing for uh, gender um, conforming care, gender affirming care. So bringing it closer to the west side, this is Edelman, uh, which some of you may have seen the photo on the left is the outside of the clinic, not the most appealing place, certainly not a place where most of us would want a vacation. Uh, but if you're on the inside, it's actually a little bit more warm and welcoming. It has hardwood floors, but it's a, a facility that's aging. It has some problems, but it is quite large and it's one of our larger programs and, and one of the most well-staffed programs that we have. But a lot of our services don't happen inside of brick and mortar buildings. They happen in the field. Uh, we have both field clinical services for those folks who are in need of care, but can't quite make it into the clinic especially with older adults, we do a lot of home visits and we offer medication services and case management and working with the pharmacist now and getting a mobile van that can deliver medications like a pharmacy on wheels, essentially. We also have a program or a team called the Home Team, the Homeless Outreach and Mobile Engagement Team. They work in places that are urbanly dense and populated by a lot of unhoused individuals uh, like Skid Row and Hollywood are the two most prominent teams and they actually do outreach to those folks that are living on the sidewalk or in tents or in encampments, trying to engage them in services. And lastly, there are times when it's not safe to send just a mental health clinician out. For those cases, we do have law enforcement collaborations with everything from the sheriff's department to local police departments, where a mental health clinician who's trained to respond to crisis rolls out alongside a law enforcement sworn officer. Now, oftentimes they're ununiformed, so it doesn't intimidate or threaten folks. But probably the biggest field-based service is a full service partnership. The way I always describe this is that they address those needs of people who were not for this program, but either be incarcerated or in an institution. So they treat folks at um, the margins and wherever they need, and they're also 24 and seven, they can respond to crises, but it is our highest level of outpatient care uh, that allows people to remain in the community. And there are more contacts with the therapist and the doctor for these programs and for others. And it does come in many cases with housing subsidies. So the last thing I'll talk about is who's eligible to receive DMH services. Um, you know, it's pretty much all those folks who aren't captured by private insurance or self-pay. We want to make sure that access is met by everyone. So we don't require proof of citizenship. 
We don't require um, any type of insurance. Certainly if you have Medi-Cal or Medicare, we try to work with those plans. But most of the time when someone has private insurance or Kaiser or managed care, they have places that they can go. So we do a screening at the intake and determine what level of service you need. Is your severity high enough? We are the county's severe and persistently ill mental health plan. So the mild to moderate things go to the physical health plans like LA Care or HealthNet. But um, we do work with anyone who doesn't have coverage. So it's the safety net is really what we provide services for. So you don't have to be able to pay for treatment. Some people do have a share of cost, but we work with folks so that they don't end up with huge bills based on getting care. I think this is my last slide or one of the last ones is the access number. Again, I would encourage you to either screenshot or save it or do something so that you have it handy. I know I've had to give it out to neighbors and friends uh, who are having crises. We also suggest that for someone who is suicidal in particular or experiencing suicidal thoughts, they can be referred directly to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, or they can also text. And if you go to the DMH website, which is listed here, you can find out more about our services that are far beyond the scope of this talk with the time that I've had. So that's it for my um, sharing about the road to recovery in West LA. Thank you so much, Dr. Curly Bonds. It was so helpful to see all those different resources. Um, this presentation and the whole town hall today is gonna be recorded. So if anyone wants to revisit any of those resources, don't worry if you're like me and could not remember all that by memory, we got you. Um, and thanks so much, Dr. Curly Bonds for making the time to be here today. Um, so we have three more presentations today to share a little bit more about local resources and initiatives. These will be um, a bit more brief. They're about five minutes each one. And we'll head on over into the, um, the panel Q&A after that. So I'm going to pass it over next to council member John Erickson. And um, he'll be sharing about City of West Hollywood resources, promoting awareness of and linkage to different local resources. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. It's so great to be here with all of you. Um, I'm of course in my car because this is our life now with everything that we do. Um, I'm council member John Erickson from the city of West Hollywood. It is such an honor to be here with all of you. And I'm so grateful and thankful for everything that NAMI Westside does for all the providers here, for all those people that take a moment out of their days to ask you, how are you doing? How are you? <laughs> um, there is so much going on here in the city of West Hollywood. And I, I could not be more thankful for all these resources as uh, my day job is I work for Planned Parenthood. Um, and so if you are following the news, I hope you are, um, you can understand that um, it's a little active out there. And so time for, uh, small reflections, time for yourself, time to take care of yourself is something that's so deeply important. I was watching a news report this past weekend on 60 Minutes that talked about young kids and, and adolescents who have missed years of their life and are going through a mental health crisis that um, is unmatched before. And I'm from Wisconsin, and so it really hit hard and home for me to understand what my nieces and nephews are going through to understand what we are all going through and have gone through and continue to gone through. So the services that we provide here that you all provide are so critical. In West Hollywood, we are very proud to offer a robust social services aspect for mental health services um, that run the gamut from anything from counseling to care to issues when we're talking with rental issues with landlords anything that we would need here to do in the city of West Hollywood we're able to provide it through not only contractual obligations with the uh, uh, LA County because we're a contract service based city but also partners like NAMI West Side and only providing one of these types of town halls as well as everything else we've been doing are some of the ways in which we do resources uh, for our community members. Many of you know also that West Hollywood is home to a very robust LGBTQ community. And as we've seen with the ongoing attacks against our brothers and sisters and, and our trans brothers and sisters and, non, and gender non-binary community members, we need to be there for everyone at all times. And although West Hollywood is only 1.89 square miles, I always like to say that we punch above our weight. 
that we're there providing care and services and connections to LGBTQ homeless services with the LA LGBTQ Center, work with the Trans Latina Coalition, work with Trevor Project, NAMI Westside, other individuals and organizations that are directly responsible for saving lives, uplifting lives and ensuring that our stories even in our darkest moments. Additionally, we offer services that combine into mental health from sobriety and addiction to um, crisis intervention and counseling. And I'm really proud to have been the author of the city's first ever mental health and behavioral health crisis response unit, which will be a revolutionary program, which will meet not only people who are um, currently unhoused, make sure that we get them the care and compassion that they need, but also making sure those residents that are dealing with it, whether it's family, friends, or yourself getting connected to the care that we all need to provide. Those are just a few things. I did not list them all. Those are just top of mind. I'm really only here because I'm part of the Aaron Rafferty Ryan fan club at, at NAMI Westside, but NAMI Westside's fan in general. But West Hollywood is always gonna be here for these services, for this care, like so many of you, because we're home to so many. We're a refuge to so many, but we're gonna fight for everyone. And so it's just an honor, a privilege and a true blessing to be here with all of you. And I couldn't, I cannot express my gratitude enough for everyone on this call. So that's, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. That's the show, you don't need to hear from me anymore. Um, and that's, that's all I got to say. Thank you and I hope you all stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. And we will now pass it to Sharon Dunas with uh, Nami Wasele to share a bit more about some of Nami Wasele's resources. So just a second, let's see. Oh, can I share anything? Can I put anything? It says that I'm disabled as a host. So I can't share anything. I can't share a screen share. There you go, Sharon, you should have access now. Yeah, let's see, where is the screen share? Uh, uh, is this it? I hope this is it. Let me see. Yes, yes, it is. So uh, let me see if I can get this up like this and uh, move all the people. I just want to thank Curly Bonds for speaking to us today. Curly, it's so nice to see you. And, you know, I, I don't go as much to NAMI Urban LA anymore, so I miss hearing from you. So thank you for being here. And thank you also, uh, Alicia, for that wonderful yoga meditation, opening our hearts and taking in compassion and self-love and kindness. That's really the key for personal greats today. So very quickly, I am Sharon Dunas, the president of NAMI Westside LA. I'm also a licensed clinician and treat family members who are struggling with mentally ill relatives. And I've been the president of NAMI Westside LA off and on for 2000, since 2005. I have retired twice, but they bring me back. And I just, and that's how life goes, you know. And I just wanna um, say a, a quick word here about our executive director, uh, Erin Raftery, who's the blonde down there. She is dedicated to helping NAMI Westside LA and works overtime. I think she works 50 or 60 hours a week. So Erin, I just give you a round of applause always. So, and, and, and Matthew Deep, you are a gift to all of us. And, I think, you know, NAMI Westside LA is going to be honoring you. I think that's the truth. So at the end of the month. So I just want to put this up. Uh, this is what NAMI does. It's all over the nation. The NAMI story is a story of families frustrated by how little information families got about mental illness from their doctors. Families across the state of California started an organization to empower each other and learn from each other and lean on the, each other. The mission is to support, educate, and advocate for those families and to advocate for their relatives um, returning with mental illness to return to a productive life, which happens more times than, than not. Full recovery. Uh, NAMI is comprised of separate affiliates offering the educational programs designed by NAMI National. In LA County, we have NAMI Westside LA. We have four affiliates, NAMI Urban LA. We really don't have NAMI Long Beach anymore. We have NAMI Greater Los Angeles County and NAMI Antelope Valley. 
A typical meeting of NAMI West Side LA is comprised of our executor, executive director, Erin Raffer Rafferty, our outreach and program, uh, prog program person, Elizabeth Stevens, and our board president, Sharon Dunas. We, with, at a meeting, we have nine board members, so we all meet together once a month. Uh, and we also have a speaker meeting with the top professionals in psychiatry and psychology. At psychology. At a typical meeting, we might decide what programs we're going to offer to the community. All programs in NAMI are free because we know how expensive mental illnesses are, so we don't charge anything for our programs. <coughs> okay, the goal <coughs> of these programs is to fight stigma. Uh, that's the main goal, and also to teach about the etiology, prognosis, and treatment of the major mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar dis depression, OCD, panic attacks, uh, borderline personality disorder, and all levels of anxiety. Anxiety is here to stay. None of us are going to get through life without some anxiety, and it can be very useful. You know, it gets us to clean the house. It gets us to do the dishes. It gets us to get the paper done. So don't underestimate the power of positive anxiety. So in, in our NAMI class, the family to family class, it was just for all families, here's what we cover. We cover the emotional impact of mental illness on family members and individuals who get a diagnosis. You get a diagnosis from a psychiatrist and your self-esteem is shattered. Your sense of self is so different because God, I have schizophrenia. How do I relate to this? I have bipolar disorder. What's going to happen to me? So your level of uncertainty increases. So the course uncovers understanding schizophrenia and all mood disorders, uh, understanding mood disorders and all episodes of mood disorders, basics about the brain, brain biology, and borderline personality disorder. Uh, we haven't decided if... Uh, Borderline personality disorder comes first at birth and then we develop adaptations to it or whether the stress is so great and whatnot. Borderline personality disorder develops throughout a person's young lifetime and by the time they're teenagers they have profound issues. And then we teach a whole experience of problem solving for families. We teach intensely about medications, all the benefits of medications and side effects you know, the, the either or approach to medication. We teach a whole three hour class on empathy training for family members, how to create sort of an emotional uh, level of support and showing up on the same wavelength with other family members. Nobody's superior, nobody's inferior. We're all in this together trying to solve this problem. So let's be empathic toward each other, particularly to the individual with a the diagnosis. We're taught how to communicate using, using the LEAP method of communication. We're taught about how it impacts sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, spouses, children whose parents have schizophrenia, and we have these relatives groups, and we try to problem solve the issues with these different groups of relatives. And then last but not least, the last class is advocacy. How do we advocate change in the mental health system? How do we advocate for a family member who has a diagnosis? The course, and I am not using hyperbole, is actually a graduate level course. The greatest benefit of families taking this course is they don't feel alone, they're not isolated anymore, and they don't carry a lot of guilt and shame that they cause the illness. They learn mental illnesses are not their fault, or, or the person who has the illness is not their fault either. These illnesses are multifactorial. They're caused by genetics. They're caused by street drugs. They can be can developed with trauma in childhood, but they're multifactorial. They move down through gene genealogical uh, systems for, for our ancestors. And then he also um, offers his family to family course on Zoom. We offer our speaker meetings on Zoom. And we have support groups all week long for peers, those with diagnosis and for family members. We have support groups all week long. 
you know, and what goes on in a NAMI board meeting? Uh, you know, we, we, the nine of us meet, and we might decide at the meeting to expand our program ending the silence, our peer-to-peer -peer support classes, our peer support groups. Ending the silence is the best program we have to fight stigma. We go into multiple high schools, junior highs, colleges with an individual with a diagnosis who shares his story of despair and heartbreak to recovery and with a family member who shares their story of trying to cope with this illness. That is the best stigma fighter because if we can get people to talk at a young age and communicate at a young age about these illnesses, we won't have the stigma around it. We'll be able to develop a more um, clinics, more psychiatric communities, more treatment centers, more hospitals. We need more of everything in the mental health treatment uh, aspect. We don't have enough of anything in LA County. We just don't. Even though we have this huge department of mental health that Dr. Curly Boggs explained to us. Okay, so, you know, when they tell, in this, in this ending the silence, people tell their stories and the audience asks questions or they get to ask questions of the audience. You know, how many of you had a sad day today? How many of you had an angry day today? How many of you felt lonely today? And so forth. Young people begin to talk about their mental health issues to each other and lose the stigma. We have an eight week peer to peer class for those with diagnosis for free. Helping peers learn how to manage their illness, how to prevent relapse. If they feel like going off their medications, who to call, who to connect with, how to reach out and fight stigma. The best way for them to fight stigma is for them to share their stories about their brain being kidnapped by a mental illness and the effect this has had on their emotional lives and the emotional lives of family. Hey, Sharon, sorry to Sorry I gotta to stop, don't I? <laughs> I have to stop. So uh, I, I, I just want to just share this last paragraph right here. So uh, we here's some of the speakers we have. Our wellness weekend uh, last year included these people. Dr. Xavier Armador, who wrote the book, I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. Dr. Mark Raggins, who I really encourage you to read his book. Journeys Beyond the Frontier, A Rebellious Guide to Handling Psychosis and Other Extraordinary Experience. We also talked about, we also had the speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Andrew Solomon, who wrote one of the best books on depression you could ever read, Noonday Demon, and Far From the Tree, When Children Are Not Like Their Parents. And that Far From the Tree is being banned from several countries right now. So, so anyway, families are no longer isolated and ashamed. And if that is true, we can get families and their relatives off the disability rolls. So um, I thank you for this opportunity to talk about NAMI. Everything is free. So please come and join us. And thank you, Aaron Raftery, for all your work for us. Thank you so much, Sharon. And I'm going to pass it now um, to Nick and Ashley to share a little bit about Alcott Center's resources, and then we'll be jumping into our Q&A for all the audience questions. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Majorino. I'm with the Alcott Center for Mental Health Services on Pico Robertson area. Um, I think Ashley's going to pop up my PowerPoint, I hope. <laughs> That's the plan. Um, <laughs> let's see. I need some background music. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> there we go. All right, we are in business. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our services located near Pico and Robertson on the west side. Um, the Alcott Center, um, we provide mental health, bridge housing and permanent supportive housing. Um, we're on our 43rd year of providing services to the Pico Robertson community. We are contracted by the LA County Department of Mental Health. As Curly Bonds pointed out, we're one of their contracted agencies. Um, next slide. Our mission is to enhance quality of life and empower individuals faced with mental health and housing challenges as they transition towards wellness. 
Our mental health services, we have several programs under that um, sort of an, one umbrella. Our general outpatient program, we provide services to about 350 clients at any given time. Um, depending on your circumstances, these client, these services may include individual group therapies, case management, and psychiatry, much like the services that the LA County Department of Mental Health provides. Um, we offer services in our offices, offices in the field and now virtually, and they are available to adults 18 and over who receive Medi-Cal, qualify for Medi-Cal, or who have no health benefits. So as Curly pointed out uh, earlier, the undocumented um, are welcome. And it's usually at no cost. We offer intensive outpatient services. Um, these are more like wraparound services for people that are needing um, uh, more care. And these services promote stabilization. They happen very often in the field. They usually include linkage to temporary housing and housing support. And um, I have two programs that I can describe after this. Go ahead, there you go. Oh, here we go. So this is a program that I think is interesting, um, interesting to many of you probably um, who um, run into people who are homeless or maybe homeless uh, yourselves. Um, our alternative crisis program. So this is under our DMH program. And what we can do with this program is, is as I said earlier, um, offer the wraparound services. So people can be seen several times a week by therapist, case manager, by psychiatry. And we can also link people to temporary housing, um, regardless of their ability to pay. So the Department of Mental Health, through our contract, we can pay uh, for up to six months of housing. Um, and that housing is generally in the form of boarding care, uh, shared congregate living, or sober living facilities. Um, it's a great program for people that uh, need to get back on their feet or and maybe they need to get back to work or their benefits have lapsed and we can help them get their benefits going. And while they're in services with us, we can help link them to more permanent sources of housing. Um, our prevention and early intervention program, we offer um, evidence-based practices, including crisis-oriented recovery services, CORES, seeking safety, um, which is often useful with people with co-occurring disorders, um, let's say depression and some sort of substance use, and individual cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, through this program, uh, this, this program is generally a short-term program, so people coming in um, with sort of uh, less severe symptoms at the time um, are offered you know, usually a dozen uh, visits. And then if they need more, we can roll them into one of our other programs. But the goal is always to you know, hope that they can uh, do well with this program. And through this program, we also operate the Pico Robertson Health Neighborhood. So the Pico Robertson Health Neighborhood is a collaborative of social services providers and uh, that work in the Pico Robertson area. Uh, these providers include the LA County Department of Mental Health, Department of Public Health, um, the LAPD, Recovery International, um, Vista Del Mar, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, PATH, People Assisting the Homeless. Um, all of us, we come together every month and we meet and we discuss um, any sort of challenging cases in the area and how to help people access services in our area. Um, in addition, we provide monthly lunch and learns, uh, which Ashley maybe can talk a little bit more about when she does her first field. Um, uh, in fact, at our next lunch and learn, it looks like we will be showing a uh, movie, a film by uh, indie film called uh, Light. And it's about the effects of mental health and social media. So really cool. Um, it was a very good film. I actually saw it today. And anybody is open to attending those. Um, and then the other programs that we offer have to do with homelessness. We all know that ho homelessness is a crisis, at a crisis point in Los Angeles County and um, that it affects many people with uh, mental health challenges and uh, also exacerbates mental health challenges. So, you can go ahead. In 2018, we garnered a contract with the Department of Health Services under their Housing for Health program. 
And this includes offering intensive case management and linkage to referrals of homeless individuals that come through the county uh, CES system, coordinated entry system, as well as those that are being diverted from incarceration. Um, and they are all linked with, all of the people that come to us are linked to subs housing subsidies. So our, our main goal is really to help them stabilize and help them find housing. Uh, we now serve 580 individuals and small families within that program. And uh, similar to homelessness, reentry into society from being incarcerated uh, is a major stressor for many of the individuals that we serve. Um, we offer, through, for reentry, we offer two bridge homes. Um, I think you can go to the next slide, actually. So we have a program called Fisher Place, which is located in South Los Angeles, just south of USC. And this is a bridge home for 43 men, all experiencing mental health challenges that have been released from incarceration. And in this program, we offer 24 seven care, including um, nursing, case management, therapy, we recently were fortunate enough to garner a contract with, the, with SAMHSA, which is a substance abuse um, contract. So we offer in-house substance use services now and psychiatry. So the guys receive really uh, comprehensive care um, and they enjoy uh, their field trips um, and they, they, uh, they flourish there, they really do. We have a second facility called Bandera and it's very similar to Fisher, same services. Uh, except this is for 20 men and 20 women. There are two separate houses across the street from each other, but same type of services that we offer there. And then our last program, which we just uploaded over the last year is a project home key. Um, and it was actually LA's first project home key site. It's an 80 unit former hotel that was purchased by LA County and has been transformed into individual apartments. We are just finishing construction on it. We have 61 of those units filled and we're looking forward to having the last uh, 19 units filled. It is staffed 24 seven with security uh, reception. And we work actually with Exodus Recovery. They provide the mental health services and case management services on site Monday through Friday. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, we contract primarily with the LA County Department of Health and the um, LA County Department of Mental Health. We also recently added an enhanced care management program through LA Care and um, through SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Those are our main primary contractors. And I'm gonna let Ashley talk to you a little bit about our art studio, and then we will, uh, hopefully, hopefully we didn't go over our five minutes. I promise I'll be quick. Um, and I just have one slide to share. Uh, let me just go up here really fast. Okay, so I just wanted you all to be able to see what our art gallery looks like. Um, so our art gallery is located next to our mental health center, which is pictured below. And through our art gallery, we actually provide um, community-based studio arts classes, and they're open to everybody for free. And really the purpose of these studio arts classes is to reduce the stigma around mental health challenges because we open it up to the community and invite Alcott Center clients as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a link in the chat to where you can sign up to be a part of these art studio classes virtually. And recently we actually partnered with the Department of Public Health who is supporting us in being able to provide take home art supply kits to make it more accessible. Um, and then just with that, I wanted to echo off of everything that that Nick said and just to illustrate how our services have grown in the mental health and housing space over the last five years. So in 2022, we are anticipating serving almost 2000 clients, which is a really big jump from where we were at in 2018. So I just want to echo that the Alcott Center is doing great work and we're really happy to be able to support the community in the way that we are. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I will pass it on to you, Matthew. And I think we went a little bit over five minutes, but I hope not too much. <laughs> totally fine. There's just so much out there, you know, so much to talk about. And thank you everyone for sharing about all the great work that you're leading in the community. 
That was a lot of information. Um, so we're gonna take a moment to step back really quickly with Alicia to just kind of ground us one more time as we open up for the Q&A. Um, so just be a brief grounding exercise. And so as we are preparing to go into the Q&A, um, you'll be using the raise hand function below to let us know that you have a question. So um, go ahead and just get familiar with that toolbar down there. It's on the bottom of your screen with the little smiley face that says reactions. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it to Alicia right now to help ground us as we get ready for this conversation. For sure, thank you. And just so I'm aware of container and time, how long would you like this exploration to be? Maybe if we can make it like two, three minutes. If that's and we're like gonna that. make it two, three minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks Amazing. Me. Yeah, of course. Okay, so um, just turning off my self view. So just thank you um, all for the incredible support you provide to our community. And as Matthew mentioned at the very beginning, it's, it's really imperative to fill our own cups. So with that said, um, I'll invite you to take a few moments just to wiggle your body. Um, maybe you notice the ground underneath you, just tuning into support. And as you do that, maybe orienting to the space that you're in, just naming objects that you see. And if it feels comfortable, tuning in to your breath. So the inhales as they move in through the nostril into the chest, maybe the belly. And exhales, you let that, you let that exhale go. And if you need, I just noticed in my body, I do need some wiggle. So if it's accessible and you're able to move, Maybe you'll change your, your seating. If you're sitting, maybe you'll come to standing. Maybe you'll stretch out some legs, stretch out your legs. Maybe you'll invite some shoulder rolls, moving in one direction, then in the other. Again, coming back to your sense of grounding, the sport with the support underneath you. And with that, dancing with your breath. So bringing some awareness to inhales and exhales as they move in and out of your body. Inviting some neck rolls, maybe bringing the right ear or in ear to your shoulder, chin to chest. Pausing whenever you wanna take notice. And bringing that other ear to your other shoulder. More breath cycle, just as you are. Again, cultivating a sense, non-judgment of compassion, of comfort and care. Maybe you bring one hand to the heart, one hand to the belly, if touch is comfortable, or you bring both hands to the heart, just pausing. Maybe you blink the eyes closed for a moment to tune into the internal environment, the internal space, or you can have a soft gaze. And taking a few moments just like this, tuning in to your sense of grounding, support from the earth, it's unconditional, unwavering support. And notice if you can lean into that support 1% more. Bowing chin to chest, just honoring, offering deep gratitude and loving kindness to yourself. And I'll invite you to orient yourself to the screen so that we can prepare for our Q and I. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. And is there, um, if you could drop in the chat, maybe like how we could reach you if we're interested in ever working with you or having that, having you hold space for us. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, so now is the time where I invite you all to um, use the raise hand function if you have any questions for our speakers, our presenters for today. Um, so I'll give a second for y'all to go ahead and do that. And I'll call them in the order that I see 
in um, the screen up here. All right, lots of questions already. Awesome. So I'll go ahead and pass it to Mark. Hello, hello, hello. My question is, how are the resources we've been learning about today being shared with different ethnic or cultural groups, especially those with historically low access and utilization rates? And um, any of the speakers want to go ahead, no particular order, feel free to answer and no pressure for all speakers to answer um, either. Yeah. Well, in NAMI, we work with NAMI Urban LA uh, in Inglewood, and they are primarily African American and Latino. NAMI affiliate, we're partnering with them. We got a Department of Mental Health grant to make sure all of our programs go to that population of people. And we find that, uh, you know, reaching out to them in churches is probably the best way to reach them. So we're very conscious of multi ethnic. Uh, tentacles reaching out to all the different populations in LA. Okay, thank you. Um, did any of the other speakers want to speak on that? I could add. Um, yeah. So the Alcott Center is located on kind of the border of service area four, six, and it, we're in five but we're on the border. And our, our clients come from all over, all over LA. Um, probably 40% come from service area six. Um, and I, in looking at our data, I can tell you that our, um, the populations that we serve, we do serve a high number of um, African-American, Latino, uh, and white. Uh, but those are our primary, um, the primary populations that we serve. And, you know, certainly, through outreach, through our health neighborhood, um, all are welcome um, to help just get the, the people that really need the services in. So we're, we're doing it too. We're doing our best. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. And was there anyone else that wanted to add to that? And no worries, if not, we can go to the next question, but I'll just hold a second there to see. Matthew, I'll jump in just for a second. Yeah. Um, Mark, thank you so much for your question. And I think it's something that we're constantly working on. Um, we had our listening session um, that Matthew moderated at the end of April and really wanting to hear from our community and making sure that he, um, we actually asked Matthew to do some recruiting for us to uplift voices from different communities so we could hear their perspectives. So that's one way we're doing hosting events like this to really give people an opportunity to hear um, what the needs are for our community. And then also just our early intervention and prevention, really trying to work with um, uh, LAUSD and different school districts to get into schools and um, do the ending the silence presentation like Sharon was talking about earlier, really trying to reduce stigma, eliminate that shame so people can start talking about mental health at an earlier age. That's awesome. Thank you, Aaron. All right, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, we'll go ahead and pass it to um, the next question then, um, I see Megan. Hi everyone. Um, so I was actually curious, um, like what other local resources do you know of that have a more like holistic approach to mental health and wellness? Like for example, not only clinical resources, but ones that consider many facets of wellness, such as like physical or spiritual wellness. Yeah. I. I'm biased. I love that question. But if there's anyone here that wants to, to speak on that. Well, there are some Buddhist centers that NAMI Westside LA refers individuals to if they're interested in meditation or learning about Buddhism, which is a philosophy to release one and to let go and to live in the present. Yeah, the whole Buddhist philosophy is letting go, release, and open yourself to what is and accept what is. 
So there's Insight in Santa Monica. There's the Shambhala Center. So we do have that as a possible outreach for spiritual growth. And having a mentally ill relative is one of the most spiritual experiences anyone could ever have. It causes people to grow spiritually, you know, because it's so uncertain, unpredictable. And so it is a huge spiritual leap to cope with someone with a mental illness. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, that was really useful insight. I appreciate that. We have offered uh, meditation and Tai Chi at times and yoga um, at various programs. Um, part of the part of the challenge there is that it's not it's not usually paid for by the contract, so it has to be either a volunteer coming in uh, or other funds paying for it. But periodically we offer it. I don't know offhand. I think we may be offering meditation at the moment. Um, we do a writing group. We have art therapy. I mean, those those things are uh, non-traditional sort of mental health treatments, um, and they are included in our treatments. That sounds really amazing. Thank you. Sure. Megan, sometimes we also partner with other organizations. Uh, for example, for Mental Health Awareness Month, we're partnering with Allo, um, Allo Yoga. So we're having a couple of different events with them. So um, you can check them out on our website or perhaps I'll, I'll drop it in the chat box. But there's um, some offerings that we're doing, one at the beach. Um, we actually built a healing garden at the Big Heart Ranch in Malibu. And we're going to be doing like a sunset um, sound bath there um, next week. So um, we do have some of those offerings specifically during Mental Health Awareness Month. The garden and the sound bath sounds really cool. Um, yeah, so I would love to see that um, information shared. Thank you. I also just wanted to mention that personally, I go to a studio called Hollowed Ground and they do community classes where they open up their sound baths and like yin yoga to everybody for free. So I can put a link to that in the chat too. Thanks, Ashley. That sounds really amazing as well. Of course. Yes, love all this resource sharing. And even the chat, I noticed people are sharing some resources. Like if you have anything to share with some of these questions, feel free to add it in the chat as well um, that you think might be helpful for people. Um, and thank you, Megan, for this question. So I'm going to pass it next on over um, to Heather. And just a reminder, if you have any questions that are coming up for you, feel free to raise your hand um, using the raise hand function. Hi, so I actually have two questions. Um, are you hopeful that we'll be able to integrate peers as an essential part of our mental health workforce? And are you seeing that happen in any of the spaces you currently work in? Um, I can speak for the Alcott Center. We have a peer in um, peer staff full time in our um, full service partnership program, which is the wraparound care program. And we have a peer in our substance use program that works in our bridge home. So we are starting to incorporate it more and more. Um, in the past, we've also worked a lot with Painted Brain. We've partnered with them. Um, so we are definitely um, seeing it more and doing it more. And I'll speak for NAMI. Uh, we have several peers that work for us. Uh, every time they teach the peer-to-peer -peer class, we pay them for every night of teaching. Every time they run a support group for us, the um, peer support groups, they are paid for their time being a facilitator. So we have several peers that we employ ongoing and, and hopefully more to come. Yes, and jumping in there, our for NAMI Westside LA, our peers uh, are such an essential part of our programming. Uh, we could not do the support groups and our classes without them. So really grateful for our peer voices because we really want to hear from a place of lived experience. I know I personally identify as a peer and um, I really appreciate when our voice